Ivan. Ivan. Yeah. Can we speak about uh, running uh, Iron Ruby and all the uh, stuff on the DLR on uh, Mono? Um, the DLR is something quite new to uh, the for the Zero, and uh, we can run that on uh, Mono 2.6 trunk. Yeah, trunk. Uh, you can't build it at the moment, so yeah. I want to apologize. I've had a I'm, I'm largely unprepared. I started preparing four days ago, and I've had um, that's, that's um, than unfortunate, uh, unfortunate yeah, timing problems. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I, I couldn't build mono on uh, Iron Ruby, so I started trying to build mono from trunk. Um, I ran into some new trouble from VMware Fusion, refusing me to get into my Ubuntu machine, which made me build a new Ubuntu machine, and go on and on and on. Fast forward three, day three days later, I finally have an Ubuntu machine that runs on VirtualBox, but I had to create it in VMware on workstation on my Windows box. Uh, I configured it there, so it wasn't the best experience I think I've had so far. Um, but in the end, I've got some demos. Uh, and I've got slides with a few pictures. Um, so I'll try to share those. Um, let's first start with opening the slides. Mm. Have um, some of you used Iron Ruby before, or know it exists? Uh, that's already good. Um, presentations, Fosdem. I have to work out how to get it on that screen. That will be interesting too. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Iron Ruby. Uh, we call it the Ruby and .NET love child. Um, you'll find out soon. Ruby is a nice language to work with. .NET is a great platform to program against, and you get lots of platform uh, compatible cross-platform stuff out of the box, which isn't in the Ruby classic Ruby implementation. So that's one of the biggest advantages. But we'll see some more later. Um, my name is Ivan Porto Carrero. I've uh, I'm been developing for as long as I can remember. But at the same time, I could read and write. Um, I just started a company, White Rabbit Consulting, and I have to thank my partner for creating these slides uh, because I, I didn't have the time, obviously. They gave me a C Sharp MVP ship this year, but this is uh, because of my contributions to Iron Ruby that has nothing to do with C Sharp or uh, my preference of C Sharp. And Manning uh, contacted me to write uh, Iron Ruby in Action, the, or a book about Iron Ruby. There is another one um, that deals with different concepts. <coughs> Um, what are we going to talk about? First, an introduction to Iron Ruby, then why you would actually want to use Iron Ruby, because um, C Sharp is a fine language to work with, why would you leave it? Um, how you can leverage uh, Ruby libraries from within your .NET projects, which is kind of exciting. Um, I've had a request to integrate uh, Active Merchant, which is a payment processing uh, facility that integrates with lots and lots of different payment gateways into .NET Merchant, um, which you can do, and Iron Ruby enables you to do that stuff. Um, then there is Sinatra. I think I will just do that demo using Ruby, because I'm, I'm also unable to install gems on my Mac. Um, I get an OpenSSL error on Mono, on Linux. I get an invalid path error, so I have to get in and fix that in the Iron Ruby source code. Um, Iron Ruby plus Silverlight. I'll have to show the Silverlight one because there is also a config file error someplace, and I couldn't see the the website or the little Silverlight application with it um, in Moonlight, unfortunately. <laughs> um, BDD, oh, BDD with RSpec and Caricature. So RSpec will probably be one of the first places to start using Ruby, or one of the good fits for Ruby. It's uh, around testing and doing behavior-driven development. Uh, and then you, at a certain point, you're going to want to mock, and Caricature bridges the gap between the Ruby language and the CLR to mock stuff out. And then extending existing apps, which is probably the whole reason of getting the mono machine together. Um, 
that is uh, extending existing apps. I'm going to extend Banshee, and Banshee will afterwards be able to run Iron Ruby written plugins. Um, I didn't get into the API of Banshee too much because I had too much other stuff to worry about, like getting the environment to run. So I have very simple plugins. Um, so what is Iron Ruby? Iron Ruby is Microsoft's first open source project. Um, and they had lots to learn. They are learning um, every week. They're getting better at uh, doing open source and communicating with the community and taking feedback and actually integrating it. Um, it's about the DLR. Uh, it's the DLR team that wrote these uh, libraries. And um, I will situate it later in the framework, later in the slides, what the DLR or why it stands for. But the people working on C Sharp 4 will probably already know. Um, it's currently 1.0 uh, RC1. We did that mainly because within the Microsoft.net world, people are reluctant until you stamp it with 1.0. So we couldn't go on with 0 0.93, 0 0.94. Um, so now it's RC1, RC2, and we'll see how far it goes. Uh, so there will be an RC2 imminent this week. And uh, the, there is a bug in Mono, but it's already with Lupus now. So I think Lupus will fix it sometime soon. <laughs> and then uh, we can build Iron Ruby on Mono as well. So. It gets a little bit confusing with CLR, DLR, BCL, and all these other uh, acronyms we've got around the place. Um, so uh, to situate how it was before, I've got this slide. You know, the lowest layer has got all these class loading, garbage collection, yeet, and all this stuff going on. You've got a security layer, code access security layer on top of that. And then you've got the common type system, which is what enables you to use VB and all these other languages, statically compiled languages on top of the CLR. And then you've got the base class libraries, which allow you to write ASP.NET forms or uh, GTK applications or uh, all these kinds of applications. Uh, currently, you can only use them with statically compiled languages. But from the next incarnation of the Microsoft.NET Framework, and I think soon I've, s I've been building Mono with Profile 4 enabled, so I'll keep trying until it works, and then I'll blog about it. The DLR is between the base class libraries and the common type system, so that has some implications. Um, <coughs> that means you've got a shared dynamic subsystem, and you've got a shared hosting environment for both these static and these dynamic languages. That means your dynamic language can access the whole object model and all classes that are defined in the static classes languages as well. Um, you get from your, from your dynamic language, you get a full access to the, to the CLR. That means you can use any type, any library that is already compiled in C Sharp, just require it in your Ruby file, and you're good to go. Um, you'll probably want to give it some attention for uh, dealing with generics, but that's fine. Uh, it enables fast code um, code generation of dynamic code. And so if you want to generate code at this point, um, I think Mono has a compiler as a service, so you could possibly just send it C-sharp and have it run with an eval statement. Uh, on, the, on the Microsoft, you only have to get the reflection emit and emit IL, and that's how you can generate dynamic code. Um, in Ruby, it would also just be an eval statement, so you have much easier code generation tools. The biggest reason why you should care is uh, development, oh yeah, development productivity. Uh, the turnover for a mocking library, the mocking library I wrote uh, for caricature, took me two weeks and a half to build. And it's on par, feature-wise, with MockU. Uh, MockU took several months to build. That's the kind of productivity enhancement you get from writing these type of frameworks that aren't mission critical and performance critical to your application. And uh, the biggest reason, for me at least, um, DSLs, they are everywhere. You're confronted with DSL a million times a day. Every time you do a build script, every time you have a config file, every time you write uh, a manifest for an application, like in the mono add-ins, XML files, um, Unfortunately, these, XML, these DSLs are written in XML. Um, the, for me, I think the main reason people do this, or at least the enterprise architects use XML, is because they don't have to recompile their application. 
to actually change the way it works. Uh, they just can reconfigure this thing, and then you get into a sort of configuration hell. If you've ever written a sufficiently large WCF application, you know that's where the pain point is. It's the XML configuration. So you get the same benefits from using a scripting language like Iron Python or Iron Ruby. You don't have to recompile your application, but you can write an, a nice DSL, or you can use the object model straight up without parsing an XML file to actually uh, configure your application and to change stuff. You can also poke it with a stick, because you can add a ripple to it and start interacting with your application at runtime. Uh, yeah, Phil Haack, uh, he told me that friends don't let friends do XML, so this pretty much sums up my own feelings around this subject as well. Uh, to show you, a typical, um, a typical configuration would be an IOC container uh, that has lots and lots of classes in it, uh, links lots and lots of types and interfaces together. Oh, what's going on? Um, there's my other one. I swear I had another one. So I wrote this DSL um, to configure Ninject, for example. Uh, Ninject is one of the IOC containers. Um, and this would be normally, you would see lots and lots of tags. Uh, one of the problems is once you open it in a text editor, it's just noisy uh, to get to the points you actually want to know about. Uh, for me, this reads a little bit better. But it's nowhere near finished um, because of stuff like this. Mm, let's get back to this thing. Okay, so now we get to Ruby. Why would you want to use Ruby as a language in total? Um, Ruby became lo very, very popular in a very short amount of time, probably because of the Rails framework. Uh, you often hear in the Ruby community, you will often hear, I came for Rails, but I stayed for Ruby. And for me, pretty much, pretty much the same way. I started doing a little bit of Rails out of curiosity, and then I just went for Ruby because it was so much more fun to program it. And you have all these little, uh, it's a really malleable language, so you can make it look almost like anything you want. You just start off with a template, that's how I want it to look, and then you start coding away until it looks like that. Um, it's got some really well chosen keywords, and it's uh, a mix, the best of breed implementation of a programming language. Uh, I'd say. So it's a mix of Smalltalk, Perl. Uh, it has intrinsic support for regular expressions, for example, if you like the regular expressions. Uh, it does uh, text processing really well. It has blocks and all these things that borrow from Smalltalk. Um, it borrows from Lisp a little bit as well. Um, for example, Ruby has two different keywords uh, for doing if and if not. It has if and unless, and it allows you to place them before or after a statement or an expression, at least. Uh, it does duck typing. It does all this kind of sty typing stuff. Uh, so duck typing is the opposite of what you're seeing here. Uh, for me, this is how you program a statically compiled language. Yes, you have to label everything up front, and then uh, the compiler knows what to do with it. Um, Ruby is a bit more fair in this. It just infers everything, uh, but it's still strong typed. Okay, the, that was the whole talk, so now it's all demos. Um, I didn't want to bore everybody, so... <laughs> uh, for, um, I'll use um, caricature as first part to show you how this BDD stuff works. Does anybody practice BDD uh, at all in uh, C Sharp? I don't uh, even know what C Sharp means. You don't even know what BDD means. Uh, Behavior-driven development. So it's like TDD, test-driven development, except that now you're not forced to test every little bit of your uh, class. You just test the public interface, basically. You describe what your class should be doing in a much more fluent language. I'll, yeah, I'll just show you. <laughs> um, let's say I've got uh, a ninja class. And a ninja class has got all kinds of nonsensical properties and methods. Um, it will attack, it will survive attacks, and all this kind of stuff. I used to have a Chuck Norris class, but it got killed somehow. Um, 
And then uh, you probably want to uh, test that ninja class at some point. So we've got the CLR models, that's where it's namespaced. Can you read this thing in the back or do I make it larger? Uh, okay. Um, better? Uh, so you namespace that's compiled in an assembly and then uh, I create an isolation. I took this from uh, the type mock guys, they call it an isolation so you're not bothered with mock stuff and all that stuff. Um, you create an isolation for I weapon, the interface of a weapon, then um, it should obviously work without any expectations, so my thing should just work and then I, I'm testing by mocker here. So. Uh, I can set up an expectation when when this ninja gets attacked um, with this type of parameter it should return 5 and otherwise it should return nil. That's how it's programmed. Um, and that's how it goes. So you probably just describe the behavior of, of your application up front by um, doing something like this. You just write it out. This is what my class is supposed to be doing and then you start filling out these uh, little sentences and uh, fill up the behavior in your class. That's uh, pretty much how it works. Uh, what doesn't this thing do? It doesn't do uh, private method interception and it doesn't do static method interception. That's because it's a CLR limitation and I know how to get around it on Windows. I'm still looking how to get around it on Mono. Um, it probably would um, uh, make me create a profiler uh, hook and that's where I, where I can intercept, I hope. Um, yeah. Now I go back down. Um, it does. Uh, uh, the most important part here is because um, uh, when you're working with a Ruby object or an Iron Ruby object, it has a Ruby view of uh, the CLR world. So that means all classes you've got in the Ruby um, or from the CLR, like system object, you can extend. That goes. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. It goes on and on. It's all the way in the bottom. I don't know how I can make it larger, higher. No. Can you make the window smaller? No. It doesn't want to take it. It doesn't want to take it either. I, I'm in a fight with my Mac currently. <laughs> um, ah. So if I were to do a class system object, ah, this would be dangerous, obviously. <laughs> uh, div to string. No, 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 uh, it's the, the way the mono, uh, the console works on mono, it's not complete, but I don't also, I can't get in to not to fix it, because uh, I don't know how to do it, <laughs> basically. Uh, if I override to string, um, Uh, it does all this useful stuff. What happens is it actually exi uh, it should print the the result of this expression, but it doesn't do that at the moment. So uh, it cuts off the first part. That's what happens. <laughs> it, it it doesn't add, add a new line. It forgets a new line for some reason. Uh, there should be a line in between every time in the console because it tells you what the result was of your expression that you put in. It's kind of like REPL. Uh, okay, so if I then take um, uh, system generic list string new to string. I hope this works. It says yay I'm a string. So uh, you, you <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, if somebody changes the way an operator works on an integer, it's time to take them out and give them a piece of your mind I, I guess. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, so it is, you have to, with great power comes great responsibility. I used to have a Spider-Man slide there to just explain this part. Uh, but it, it allows you to actually get into the CLR and make it work the way you want it to work or the way it makes sense inside your application. Um, so that's what I meant with open classes. You can generate entire programs from defining just your intent. Um, I can show you later on if I have time left uh, how you parse, like in 20 lines, how you create all kind of classes from a CSV file and interact with those classes. Okay, so that was a little bit about um, what you do with Iron Ruby and why it can be so, somewhat interesting. I have more to go. Iron Ruby and Silverlight. So for me, Silverlight or Moonlight in this case um, is what will probably give us a really good way of building cross platform GUIs that look really attractive and with a plugin that's available on 90% of the user PCs. Um, so for me, the best part about Silverlight is the way that you can take it out of the browser. You code something once and you, get an, uh, you don't have to do much work to actually run your application on all these different platforms and have it be as compelling and look the same way on all these different platforms. My biggest gripe with working on multiple platforms is I don't have a good, platform, a good editor that works on everything yet. Um, I can use MonoDevelop and Ruby Mine across the board, but I need a lightweight editor that works everywhere as well. Um, to show you what you can do with Silverlight, we have, um, you probably know, but now we're doing it from Ruby, so it's totally new. Um, uh, where did this go? And that's just, uh, I compiled something wrong. And I have a library flag sitting there. Um, sure exposed. Yeah. So this is a very complicated Silverlight application that apparently can't get to the internet. There's supposed to be a rabbit here. Yeah, this this won't work. Hmm. My rabbit is gone. Okay, so I'll I'll do another one. Projects. Okay. Uh, we wrote uh, um, Tetris because yeah, that's such a hard thing to write um, in Silverlight. This is completely powered by Mono. Uh, by Ruby, Iron Ruby. Uh, it's not powered by Mono, it's the Mac thing. Um, and we can start this uh, thing. I'll show you the code in a minute. So I can move this thing around and drop my blocks. I won't play this for very long. Uh, because, uh, so we have a bug. You will see in a minute. That's a bit troublesome. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff, so you get an, uh, go back down, give me this one. Um, uh, I need to do this in the other one. I hope you can see the text change on the button. I'll try to make the text change, otherwise I'll do the, uh, the color change. Um, application. So you get this ripple console where you can interact. You can do this in any type of application. I didn't do it in the Banshee one because I don't know G GTK uh, widgets and stuff, so I don't know how to create a ripple window. Um, application current 
root visual. You can inter you can interrogate it. So the root visual it's got all these properties. Uh, it should probably wrap it around. Uh, but you can you can find out what what's in your application at the moment. Uh, application current root visual. Is it background? Uh, or system windows media. This is dangerous, huh? Colors? Colors? Oh, I need a brush. Solid color brush. Brush red. Uh, it doesn't have red. Um, but you could potentially change all this type of stuff. <laughs> So you could also change uh, all the text or how the, the blocks look and stuff like that. But it's a good way to debug your application and to find out what's going on exactly at that point when you feed it these type of things. I quite like the whole console app, uh, console uh, experience. Uh, but I haven't done much Silverlight, obviously. But now I'm hell-bent on showing I can do it. So, I've got this button here. Um, I, it's hard for me to zoom uh, because I need to type in the bottom. But it says go, go, rabbit, if the ra rabbit would show. Uh, and we're going to make it into a much more difficult text, like hello world or something. So it goes the same way. Application, current, root, visual. Uh, normally, if you do Silverlight, uh, you would have to go now, find by find name something something, and then it will return you. Uh, so that those are some of the things you can easily mitigate in uh, Ruby. I'll show you in a minute how I've done this. Uh, it's called my button text oh, text equals hello Fosdem. <coughs> No, no, it's, it's content. I've been here before. So it does throw errors, you know. And they're quite useful. It says it doesn't have text. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. I, I changed it. It says, hello, Fosdem now. Yay! <laughs> the demo that worked. <laughs> um, now, how does this thing look? That's maybe also a good thing. Um, mate. So all the code, uh, you have a Silverlight um, SL command. Um, SL Ruby will create a Ruby Silverlight application and that generates this, uh, this structure here, app CSS index. And the idea is that in app, uh, you start programming in the app.rb file. Uh, this is what gives us REPL. We overwrote the standard out, so we redirect it. Um, then uh, this is generated, so you don't have to worry about this. Did I do the framework element over? Oh, it's not there. Um, there is a framework element override somewhere in the. Um, in one of the classes uh, that have been defined by the framework uh, to run these Silverlight applications with Ruby, and that allows you to override, to look into. So if you would write this in Ruby, there is one method that is very interesting, that is a method missing method. That allows you to respond to, method missing, uh, to missing methods, obviously, uh, and actually redirect, and it's used often as a method dispatcher. So you would go class uh, framework, element to get to the lowest one and then you get the biggest win. Uh, def method missing name arcs this is like params in C sharp uh, 
MB takes a function pointer. Uh, if respond to mm, no. find name. You don't have to do return statements, but I'll just do it for clarity. This So this would then first try to look it up. If you pass it a string, it goes and looks up if it can find this, uh, this control. If it cannot find a control as a method, then it will delegate it to whatever was there before and probably throw an error. Um, it's these little things you can do. So what we have here is we have an event handler that does the click. Uh, my rabbit would have turned around. We made it skew and all these things, uh, but it's gone now. Mm -hmm. Sinatra has entered the building. So this is one of the nicer parts. Uh, if you've ever been writing an application and you need to get some web data up or uh, need to talk it to get it talking to a web service that spits out XML or stuff like that, Ruby's got a Sinatra um, framework which allows you to write a, a, a write the Hello World application. Uh, hmm. Then goes something like this, uh, require Sinatra um, git do uh, that's how you write a entire website. Mm. Sinatra may have not been the best name. So it started a web server. Uh, if everything goes right, it should show me um, Hello World. Hey, so you can. Uh, have it generate XML at that point. Uh, you can um, make it talk to a database. If you leverage one of the other Ruby components, it will spit out XML, JSON, whatever format you've given it, and it knows about the serialize to just put it all out there. So that's a really nice addition. You get a web server up, a web service running in under five or ten minutes, probably, uh, maybe under an hour, depending on how fast you are. That's why I wanted to have Sinatra entering the building. Um, in the last part, extending appli uh, existing applications is probably the more interesting part. Um, you all know Banshee probably. <laughs> but that's the whole point of my uh, virtual box thing here. Okay. <laughs> So I can't open the solution in MonoDevelop. I uh, copied, I installed 2.21 this morning, uh, but it comes up with a, an error. Um, but I can use it to browse the code. Um, in, I was pretty lucky because there was already a boost script service in uh, a Banshee, so I just used the boost script service and ported it to how you would use it with um, the DLR and how you would execute that code. Uh, we can find that probably in source, Banshee, Banshee. So, uh, we've got another source folder, extensions, Iron Ruby script. Um, uh, I had to create a, a Banshee add-in uh, definition. Uh, just open it. Oh, yeah. 
I just want to show colors. <laughs> uh, source extensions and Ruby script branch here in Ruby. This is probably not big enough for uh, in the back. I wasn't pre planning on uh, font and colors. Oh, that's a bit too big. Okay, so I've got the boost script service. And that boost script service, yeah, it uses a bunch of references. I referenced uh, the DLR languages, uh, the DLR itself, Microsoft scripting and all these things. Um, then I referenced the Iron Ruby libraries and I looked into what uh, the boost script service referenced, which is Hyena and some of the Banshee uh, things. Uh, I, I made this again. I just now I get Ruby Envy, so I think most people define this for each method as an extension. Somebody forgot it to include it in the framework. Um, then I just do what's needed to create an extension for uh, Banshee. I set a scripts directory, um, which is in. Uh, 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 Ruby scripts uh, will be my conf uh, directory, uh, a lock object. Then uh, I define a, a static script runtime. So the runtime to host DLR stuff is pretty expensive. You only want to start at runtime once uh, for the runtime of your application uh, or per app domain, perhaps. Um, and then uh, we, we get if it's already initialized, bail, uh, initialize Iron Ruby, that's probably the meat of the hosting part. So what we do is uh, we first set up a script runtime setup. Um, then uh, you tell it, yeah, I probably want to use Ruby in this case. You can do this, you can add more languages to it um, by looking at the extensions. And so you could use Scheme or Python or uh, the Iron JS that will be that somebody's written. Uh, so all the Iron languages, basically. Uh, then we create a runtime. Uh, we create a Ruby engine. So the Ruby engine is what actually will be evaluating all the code and dispatching it everywhere. Uh, and then we set some load paths. So we know if we do require something, it will look into the scripts directory first to find this file. Uh, and then uh, I just want to pass the references to my Iron Ruby um, hosting environment. So I took all the loaded assemblies and uh, I loaded them again in the runtime. Uh, then the last part of this whole undertaking is um, actually run scripts. So we go to the directory, get all the files uh, in that script directory that, that end in Ruby, and then we just execute the run script method. Uh, so the run script method just takes a file and passes it onto the engine and says, man, create a new scope. Uh, a new scope is just like a sandbox uh, you use to execute code. Everything you require in that scope is available to everything in that scope. Uh, but if you create a new one, you have a blank slate. <coughs> and it will just execute those files. Now, will this thing work? Uh, yeah. I have to press tab. Uh, Ivan... Hmm. I'll show you the first script I wrote. Uh, the first plugin I wrote is very, very uh, hard. It's, again, an Hello World one. Um, Gmate, Banshee, hmm. Ah, it's in this one. Where is my... I've, I lost my 
my box oh yeah, here it is. Um Gmate Meshi Ruby scripts. Uh, uh, so uh, I create three new lines so it stands out in the logs. You'll see why. Uh, and then it prints a star and says hello world. Um, uh, auto, oh. Because I didn't change anything, I can just make this thing. It will build. I had lots of uh, fun getting this thing to build. Um, but it's always like this, I guess, when you get into a new code base. It starts. That's a good sign. Um, so with it was. Uh, it, I have all these things that I didn't install. I didn't install all the dependencies for this build. But it says hello world, which is ultimately what I wanted to show. <laughs> I've got a much more difficult plugin, uh, way more difficult. Uh, so closing this won't be nice. Um, there we go. Gmate. Ah, it's probably still open. Config, Banshee, Ruby scripts, duration status formatter. So this is just a port of a boost script. It was in there like a boost script, and uh, the, the person, Aaron, I think, wasn't happy with the clear formatters they had that actually showed you some useful information, and he wanted some more confusing ones. So we, we have one here um, with milliseconds. We have another one that does it in ticks, and then we have one of them that is useful a confusing, pre confusing, precise formatter. And uh, I've just used those. The benefit of using, uh, oh, stop. That's not what I wanted to do. The benefit of using um, Ruby, for example, is instead of, I, I now stopped the application, but I didn't have to stop the application. I can just start, re-change my file, and reactivate the plugin, and it will execute these new plugins that I created. Um, boom, boom, boom. So, uh, I'm not going to rebuild, uh, it's not necessary. And I've got, uh, I've got here, this is a confusing, yeah, this is very sad. <coughs> it's all about this thing here. Yeah? This is a confusing, precise format, and if I click on it, we get milliseconds, but the S falls off. Yeah? And if I click on it again, we get ticks. Yeah? So that was my plugin. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes relatively uh, little effort uh, once you get your environment set up to actually start extending your own applications uh, with Mono, uh, with Iron Ruby. So you can do this and get all the benefits of scripting, uh, get a lower barrier for people entering. Uh, it's much easier to learn Ruby than it is to learn C Sharp, in, from my opinion. Um, I've been with C Sharp from C Sharp 1 uh, to C Sharp 4, and I don't know how I would start with C Sharp 4 today, because there's so much ground to cover. Okay, the last part, and then uh, you're all rid of me. I have to put this in. Yeah? We have a forthcoming book. Uh, if you talk to me, catch me on the IRC or someplace, I can give you a code that gets you 30% off. Um, and that's about it. Are there any questions? Yes? So, um, <coughs> you know the way you were saying uh, it's like it's, it's Iron Ruby yeah. and not Rails. You know the things in Rails that are nice, like for if you're creating a new date, you can just go one dot a minute. Oh, yeah, I can. all this uh, stuff is in there. Does that mean you pull in um, real stuff as well, like active support? Or well, yeah, you can do that. Um, well, I, I've got some time now. <laughs> so let's do. I don't have Rails installed, um, but you can. You can mock it. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can do it. So 
if I would start, if I close off my Linux box and I start the Windows box, I can do all this stuff there. Um, but in that, you, you can just use uh, any Ruby library out there. So we are actually very, or, yeah, we are very committed to run Rails. Um, Rails is a bit more mature as uh, ASP.NET MVC is. Uh, and it has support going on, a good community. But yeah, it runs Rails today. The only problem you've got, you're going to get is um, how will I talk to a database? We need more people to implement database drivers for MySQL, Postgres, and these things. So um, I did the preliminary work uh, to build a uh, Microsoft SQL adapter. Uh, and I abstracted everything into using the IDO.NET classes that use these um, abstract factories and this whole provider model. So you could just plug in Postgres and MySQL if you write uh, the adapter for it in Ruby. It should be, it's still a bit of work because they think differently about closing transactions and stuff. Yes? You said uh, in your plugin that you can, can just add new languages from the PLRs. Yeah, but I don't have, I didn't compile Iron Python, so no, I. So this basically means that your plugin not only enables Ruby, but any DLR. It, it, yeah, if it needs two or three more lines of code, but yes. Uh, mm -hmm. From then, you can just use any language that is uh, DLR enabled. Uh, so that is uh, quite nice. You don't have to force people to use the language you want. <laughs> they can use whatever they want. Yeah. Um, any other uh, questions? So just to <coughs> write the Ruby plugin for um, Banshee, all you need is, is it one file, basically? The Service. Yeah, this extension service is one file. The, it's it's nothing. It's this uh, seven or eight lines of code you need to set it up and to set some load paths and stuff like this. So it knows where to look file for files. But that's about it. Uh, what you need to do. Everything else is handled. Um, yeah. Okay. No more questions. That's good. What is the book out? The book. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, it, it seems that it's, it will be ready, we're scheduled to be complete uh, the 15th of February, but I don't want to be complete before it's actually 1.0, uh, because they're doing still, they're pushing some major changes in, uh, not major from the internal point of view, but major from the external point of view. Uh, certain ways of doing things don't, just don't work anymore, uh, they're now more JRuby-esque. Uh, and stuff like that. So I want to postpone this thing um, with finishing and submitting the final manuscript until it's the same as the, the set in stone version 1.0. I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> um, but there are reviewers and if you want to review the book, uh, leave your name and uh, I'll get you in touch with Manning and they'll put you on the reviewers list. Uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>